record. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we'll go through substantial damage uh, estimator overview. And so Bill is here to help me hopefully keep people on mute uh, <clears throat> to cut down on background noise. Um, and if you have questions as we go through, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the background of the software itself, um, when and where to do damage estimations and kind of that process of getting ready to um, do the uh, assessment. So you'd have to you know, establish a scope and get your team organized and all of that. And then a little bit on using the software um, and then resolution of conflicts with damage estimation. So there's a lot of really good publications that are available out there already. So we have a uh, substantial improvement, substantial damage desk reference. So I use this quite often. It really goes through all of the rules and requirements for determining if there was substantial improvement or damage um, and basically the, the regulation side of it. And then you have the substantial damage estimator a user manual and field workbook. So this is more on the actual field work and using the software. So it's much more centered around that than the actual rules of that of what you have to do. Um, but they're both very useful. Um, there's also this substantial damage estimator uh, best practices guide. So this is just a 16 page document that kind of goes through uh, doing the actual field work and how best to you know collect that data um, and what to do as far as for planning for data collection. Because um, that would be the first step is to get your plan together, um, your team, hopefully you have people to help you. Of course, we can always help you as well. And then having the tools set up ahead of time. So um, really what you should do is familiarize yourself with the software um, before something happens and just get kind of used to how it works. Maybe go through some of those um, available trainings on the software and I'll show you some of those. Um, and that way you're just a little bit more comfortable with it and hopefully you'll have your property database put together um, before something happens. So uh, that will save you a lot of time and stress later on when you're working with people through that recovery process and getting all the permits and doing the actual assessments with the data collection and everything. So just being as prepared as you can be before something happens will help you out in that recovery process. So um, it's you know, good that you're here taking the training to start thinking about it now. Uh, maybe your community has recently suffered from some of the extreme weather that we've had. So um, having this available is, is great. So there's also um, help available through the building science uh, service. That's uh, FEMA. So FEMA created the software. It's free software to use. Um, so you can call and email them if you have questions about the software, but there's a whole installation guide and the user manual is inside the tool itself. So um, again, just familiarizing yourself with that and having it ready to go for when you uh, need to do assessments is really the, the best way to go about it. So um, I actually just saw this today. I didn't know that these were available, but FEMA has these training modules um, up on YouTube. So they have videos on using the tool and uh, just going through uh, the different methods that you can use to determine market value and stuff. So um, making sure that you have your methodology sorted out before something happens as well. Um, you want to make sure that you know how you're going to determine market value and then you're going to be fair and consistent with all the assessments that you do, um, unless there were some extenuating circumstances on that. But um, it would be good to have written administrative procedures um, as an internal document. Um, and that way you know what steps you're going to go through uh, to determine those and make the assessments ahead of time. So having that plan ready to go 
Um, there's also a FEMA independent study course. So if you just search for this online and you get your student ID number, uh, you can take this free training and it will walk you through using the tool and then you'll do some assessments with um, just uh, training data. So <clears throat> there's um, it, it takes you through the process of doing the assessment as if you were assessing an actual structure. So uh, that's helpful and that class is about three hours long. So of course, we're only doing substantial damage estimation in the regulatory floodway, um, or sorry, in the regulatory floodplain. So any A zone um, is where we would be looking at this as far as the NFIP and floodplain management. Um, so that would also include any additional areas that you've adopted to regulate to. So some communities adopt uh, LOMAR F properties or future conditions or the 500 year floodplain and regulate those areas as well. So um, any other places that you've agreed to um, administer the ordinance uh, would have to be included in that. So just looking at this, uh, we have a neighborhood in the floodplain and only a certain section of those houses are in the floodplain. The rest of them are outside of it. So really any Anything within that blue line that's touching a structure, if it's just touching a little bit, you can see it's like halfway on one of the houses, it would be considered to be in the floodplain, and so it would need that assessment. So determining where your floodplain structures are is really um, like the first part of this. It's just understanding what your personal floodplain or your community floodplain looks like, um, how, many, how many structures you have in there. Um, just being really familiar with that and of course your ordinance as well. And that way you know when something happens, what areas you're gonna need to look at and potentially what the scope is of that. So some communities only have a couple of structures in the floodplain, it won't be as big of a deal for them to determine that scope. It might just be a couple of houses that you would do the assessments on and that makes it simple. If you have expansive floodplain, there's a little bit more planning involved um, and just making sure that you're prepared for any potential disaster where you might have to do a lot of assessments. So um, just showing you in this picture, those are the structures that are in the floodplain. And then of course the ones that are adjacent to that are not in the floodplain. And so they don't have to be assessed for that. So of course there, there might be other inspections that happen and community regulations for repairing those structures, but they're not um, considered for substantial damage in the same way. So uh, just pointing that out, uh, structures that are not in your regulatory floodplain don't have to be assessed. Um, so one thing that is really helpful after something happens, if you have a GIS department or you're familiar uh, with that, how creating maps yourself, um, having that overlay. So where has damage occurred and how does it uh, compare to the floodplain? So this is a 2016 um, tornado in Eureka. So they created a map showing the path of the tornado and then those green dots represent what structures are in the floodplain. Um, so not all of them were damaged. Clearly some of them are outside of that scope of damage so they don't need to be assessed. Um, and then of course the ones that were in the path of damage do have to be assessed. And so just after something has happened, determining what the scope is, how many structures are we going to have to assess, and then you're getting your team together. Um, hopefully you have other community officials that um, will assist you in doing the assessments, and so we'll go through what that process looks like a little bit. So of course, if you're in the NFIP, you have to um, determine whether proposed work qualifies as substantial improvement or repair of damage. So um, substantial improvement is mentioned here just because they're, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, it's just cost to repair damage or the cost of an improvement. And then we compare that to the market value. And if it's 50% or more, 
then that structure needs to come into compliance with the current regulations if it's not already. If it's already in compliance and it's elevated above the floodplain to what the regulations say, then nothing else needs to happen. It's just making sure that the lowest floor is in compliance if it is substantial improvement or damage. And this can be difficult to get people to comply. Um, it's pretty expensive to elevate an existing structure, but it is part of enforcement. And what we've agreed to do um, in relationship with FEMA, having that agreement to have flood insurance available to citizens and making sure that they are building in compliance so that they're reasonably safe from flooding, flooding damage. And so damage can be sustained from any source. So a fire, a tornado, an earthquake, or flooding. It doesn't have to just be flooding. Uh, so it's any source of damage. Um, and it can be difficult to get compliance, especially after something like a fire and people don't understand the relationship between floodplain regulations and uh, damage that was caused by a source that's not flooding or storm related. Um, so I've been told that can cause some issues. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of. This is um, kind of the, the more difficult side of floodplain management. Um, the more challenging types of enforcement and, of course, <clears throat> creating the assessments themselves. So, again, damage from any origin, whereby the cost of restoring to the pre-damage condition would equal or exceed 50% of the market value. So that's the pre-damage condition. Uh, we do look at depreciation and those types of things. So it's not to restore to its pristine condition it's just to whatever state it was in before the damage occurred um, and that's market value for just the structure minus the land so um, we separate those values because otherwise it would skew those numbers um, so we look at that um, based only on the structure and similarly uh, substantial improvement is any reconstruction, rehabilitation, addition, or other improvements that equals or exceeds 50% of the market value uh, before the start of construction on that improvement. So that means any internal work, anytime you're getting a permit application, we need to look at the cost of that improvement to ensure it's not a substantial improvement or work with them if it is a substantial improvement. Um, and of course, uh, tracking improvements if you have adopted standards for cumulative improvement. So you're looking at um, projects over typically the last five years. Um, it could be 10 years. So that's just another part of where you're looking at your ordinance and making sure that you're following the standards that have been adopted in there. Um, there are some uh, exclusions to this, um, any project for improvement of a structure to correct an existing violation of state or health codes or something like that, as long as it's been identified and documented by that community official before the, that happened. Um, so then that could be excluded. And any alteration to a historic structure, provided that it's not going to preclude it from being included as a historic structure. And so all of this information and further details can be found in the substantial improvement and damage desk reference. So if you're not sure about the rules, it's very detailed on what all needs to be included or excluded as far as costs like this, um, like these two exclusions and there's also another publication just on historic structures if you um, end up working with those um, there's a lot of detail in there about how to protect them from flood damage as much as possible while preserving their historic qualities um, and those types of things so and it defines what the historic structure is like who can determine that um, so yeah Definitely look at those resources if you ever have questions on that. Um, and so these, this is the process that I've pulled from that guidance on uh, what the planning process 
looks like uh, after something happened. So you have the SDE manager who's basically overseeing all of the assessments and managing the team. So that's typically going to be the floodplain administrator, so probably yourself. So that person is des designated and they identify the resources that are going to be needed. They notify the community officials and work with those other departments, especially like police and emergency. Um, those departments will be pretty important to uh, conducting safe assessments and making sure that you're coordinating with the other community departments and that you're all giving consistent information and those types of things. Then you're determining what the scope is so that you can plan those field inspections and then you're going to organize and train the inspectors to collect that field data by hopefully having some pilot uh, assessments where you all do it together so that everyone's kind of on the same page about what data needs to be collected and what the different levels of damage look like so that you're all in agreement and that it can be done consistently. So uh, you would first identify the limits of that inventory. So where all the damage has occurred compared to the floodplain, how many structures is that, where are they located, um, how far and wide are these assessments going to need to be done? All the damaged structures in the special flood hazard area. And then you coordinate with address and tax par parcel map or property boundaries. So you're going to need that property data uh, to be able to do assessments. And then you do the initial screening of structures, basically call this the windshield inspection. So you drive through the areas of damage, of course, once it's safe to do so. And you just kind of get a feel for what type of levels of damage you're seeing. Is it just lightly damaged or are there structures that are obviously substantially damaged? And then the ones you're not sure about that are between like the 35 and 65 range are going to be your top priority to start with those. And then you don't really need to do a full assessment if it's obviously substantially damaged. Um, then you can just document that and record it and get that determination out as quickly as possible. But you're really going to want to start with those medium damaged and really take a closer look at those ones uh, to determine that 50% or not, um, because it's pretty important for insurance claims and, of course, the compliance component of it. And then if people disagree, they can uh, dispute your decision and just um, submit an appeal with uh, better information, basically. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So again, defining the inventory, where all assessments need to take place, do an initial screening based on the size of the area, the number of structures, and then trying to determine how many days you're going to need to complete those assessments, because again, time is of the essence during the recovery phase when people are going to want to start rebuilding and uh, getting back to normal, but we need to make sure that they're properly permitted and coming into compliance if that's what they need to do. So you, you finalize that plan, you set up your teams, you have uh, your plan for data collection. So this team is going to go out on this day and collect information for these specific structures, making sure that they're trained on how to do that, get that scheduled to, together, and then hopefully you'll have someone that can assist you with the actual software doing data and quality assurance uh, and making sure that everyone stays on track. So you definitely want someone double checking your work before you issue the assessments just to look for any missing information or um, any needed corrections. So definitely want to work with the fire, police, and emergency management departments and let them know what your purpose and proposed dates are for inspections, because you are going to be um, entering people's houses and that kind of thing. So we want to make sure that we're being safe and that everyone is aware of what's going on and why we're doing it. Um, issue a press release, um, the reason why you're doing inspections, what the process is, what the hours of operation are, and your contact information. So 
I'm always in favor of doing a door hanger on these structures just so that they're aware before they start trying to repair things that you're going to do an assessment that they need a permit um, and just letting them know what's going on. And then you're getting ahead of the rumor mill or any uh, misinformation that might get spread around after a disaster. So that's pretty common. And we want to get ahead of that and make sure we're making people aware of this process and what is happening. So you're gathering your resources. You need that property and structure data. So that is probably working with the tax assessor uh, for your community to make sure that they can provide you with that information um, if needed. And then hopefully you'd be building your property database um, again beforehand, before something happens. And that way you have all of your special flood hazard area properties listed in your tool before you even do the assessments. And then you can just start the assessments um, after you have those records in there. So again, looking at your floodplain boundaries, typically we want to have two person inspection teams and that way um, you have two eyes on everything, making sure the two people are in agreement on the level of damage that they're seeing. And of course, for safety reasons as well. Um, and then you, you want to meet with the tax assessor to discuss your data needs um, and the formatting and determining how much time uh, their team or their office might need to assemble all of that. Because um, we're, we're probably looking at um, the tax property tax records to help us determine market value. And so that's the type of information that we would need to be getting from the tax assessor. If that's the methodology that you're using, um, again, you want to predetermine what methodology you're going to use for market value before something happens. So then you're uh, setting that schedule, how many inspections can be completed per day and what your target date is for completing that field work. So uh, FEMA says a residential assessment is typically 40 to 90 minutes and then non-residential can take longer as it's like 90 to 120 minutes. Um, typically, of course, there's a lot of diversity between uh, different types of structures. So it's just kind of a rough estimate of how long each inspection should be taking. And of course, making sure that you're collecting all of that field data and um, you know being thorough. So again, all of these things are going to depend on how many people you have assisting you and again, the scope. So um, all of that will determine how you're setting up your inspections, but basically you should know what data needs to be collected for the NFI. IP requirements, understanding the SDE tool, if you're going to use it. Um, of course, you don't have to use this tool. It's just free software that FEMA's put together to help create organized and defensible um, assessments. So it's just um, a tool to help you do that and organize it and have you know that ready to go um, with your property database that you can put together um, in advance. And then you're coordinating the collection of field materials. Um, again, making sure that your teams are all trained up and they know what they're doing and make sure that there aren't any uh, gaps or overlaps in their inspection plans, making sure all those properties are covered. Um, and then working with those city officials, again, making sure that they know what's going on. Um, maybe a police escort might be helpful. I, I've heard of communities doing that just for safety purposes. Um, because sometimes you might need special permission to enter a property and, and that kind of thing. Sometimes people don't want to let you in their house. So uh, just making sure that we're being safe. Um, of course, verifying the hours per day and days per week because we want to set that target date of finishing that collection and getting the assessments out as fast as possible. Um, ensuring procedures and requirements um, are being followed. Um, you know, making sure everyone has their identification with them. 
uh, making sure that they're collecting all of the field data and really taking a good look at those different levels of damage. Um, or tr tracking the team progress, verify that that collected data is recorded in the tool. Um, so that may also be where the data uh, management quality assurance uh, type of work is being done. And then review that data for correctness and find solutions to problems because we, we wanna make sure that we have all of that because it could really delay you if you miss something or it has to be corrected. And then of course, as I mentioned, we're identifying those areas that might be inaccessible for some reason or requires permission in advance to be able to enter that property, find that person's, you know, that, that point of contact, um, the street subdivision, operating hours and potential level of damage for these areas um, and planning ahead how you're going to access them. So once we have that, we're going to do the inspections and everyone has been shown how to collect that data, how to save it, um, making sure they have all of that uh, recorded somewhere because they might have to you know, come back to the office to actually enter everything into the tool. So um, there's worksheets and, and that kind of thing that can be written by hand. Um, so we have the DWR post-disaster manual. Um, Many of you probably have this. I send it out pretty often um, and it's on our website, but there's a lot of uh, resources in there on collecting the data. There's sample worksheets and the template letters for um, notifying people of what your assessment uh, turned out because we have to notify them of those results um, regardless of whether they were substantially damaged or not. And people need that in a timely manner for certain insurance claims like the um, ICC, there's dates, um, deadlines that they have to meet to be able to claim that. So um, the structured data is under the address and NFIP info tab. So you can um, have those pre-populated um, since there's a lot of information that would be the same for all of your properties, like uh, potentially the map panel, but definitely like the map date and that kind of stuff. So um, I'll show you some screenshots of that, um, but review that before going into the field and save time and reduce later entry that would be needed. So they suggest sorting them alphabetically by street name and then numerically by address is what they recommend. Uh, the data might be given to you by that tax assessor's office with limited sorting abilities, or it could be by the owner name or the parcel. So just determining what format that data is in. Um, you could potentially import it through the um, import feature. So there's you can import and export data. Um, so you yeah, make sure that you're familiar with what that formatting is beforehand so that you're prepared to do the assessments when something happens. And then verify the locations at the physical inspection. Um, you wanna making sure that the square footage is correct, the number of stories, um, and then verify tax data with the inspection findings. So, um, like I said, structure data can be preloaded. Um, the assessment data is only entered when you're, um, you have that record open for that property and then you start either a residential or non-residential assessment. Um, yeah, so there's the enterprise import functions for multiple property structured data. And so some of those other trainings that I showed you uh, will go through that function if that's something you want to use. So um, there is training available on how to do that. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, the user manual, which is really helpful. Um, so you can download it from this link. So you can just uh, Google search for the SDE 3.0 software and it should pull up. Um, and there's two different versions. So uh, there's a standalone where only users of that host computer can access the database, or there's client server where multiple users can access the same database once they map their network drive to it. So 
Um, and again, that would depend on how you plan on doing assessments and if you need to give multiple users access to that. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes damage is isolated to just one property, and then it should be a little bit more straightforward and less planning involved in just doing one structure. And in this case, it's obviously substantially damaged. So um, just documenting that, getting those photos and generating the report in the letter should be um, straightforward and easier than a full disaster recovery um, or multiple structures. So Coffeeville in 2007 um, had like a thousand year event I think um, their levee was overtopped, which trapped water, and then the refinery started leaking into the water, which caused about 400 structures to be completely lost. So they had to do um, a large buyout for that. Um, so we're we're looking at you know it it could just be one structure with a little bit of damage all the way up to. You know, your entire floodplain is uh, severely damaged. So determining that scope is the first part. Of course, values and repairs. Um, the fair market value prior to the damage compared to the cost to return the structure to its pre-damaged condition. Again, not pristine. And um, unless the condition was pristine prior to the damage. And... Um, if it's equal to or greater than 50%, then that's how um, substantial damage is determined. I think there are some communities that have a lower threshold, or again, um, cumulative improvements would also be factored into this. Um, so if you have cumulative improvement in your ordinance and you're also looking at any improvements or damages from the last five years, so you're probably gonna wanna look through those permit files to make sure that you're including that in your determinations. Um, oh, I was gonna mention, um, so it's the cost to repair. So whatever that full cost is, even if they decide not to do all of the repairs because of the cost or, um, so even if they don't, spend the money to do all of the repairs, it's still whatever that cost would be. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So again, the fair market value is excluding the land. So there's different methods to determine this. And this is where written administrative procedures can be really helpful. Uh, so you have all these procedures outlined in writing to make sure that you're being consistent. Uh, with how you are determining these things. So tax assessment records for property tax. Um, if people disagree with what their uh, value is, um, property tax can be um, appealed for them. So they have had the opportunity to uh, disagree with whatever the tax assessment records say. So it's fair use, um, it's usually available to everyone and it's public information and everyone knows about it. So um, that's one way of doing it. And then of course, like I said, they can appeal your decision. They could get an appraisal and provide you with that um, to prove you know, their claim that um, you know, their structure is valued higher or whatever the dispute is. It can be a bill of sale if it's been a recent sale. Um, the insurance settlement is not always the best way to go because it could be underinsured or they might have a high deductible or something like that. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Uh, tax assessment records might be the better way to go, but you can use insurance settlements. Um, and then, of course, a full appraisal uh, is probably the most accurate um, way of determining this. Some communities will just require everyone to get an appraisal um, and then compare that to the cost to repair um, and determine it that way. But if you're unsure, uh, look at the substantial um, improvement in damage desk reference. They go over this in a lot of detail on determining this and what to look out for. Um, so this is just one of the screenshots from the cost um, tab. So 
Um, the address and structure damage NFIP tabs at the to the left of that are pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. Um, this is where you can put in geographic adjustment based on um, like cost estimating guides. Um, so you can determine what the geographic adjustment is in Kansas and get that base cost and then start uh, working through those levels of damage. And then any cost adjustments that would factor into that. Sometimes there's unusual, uh, more expensive features. Um, so that's something to include in here. So that's why there's cost adjustments. And then whatever the construction quality is, um, so low, budget, average, good, or excellent. Um, and as I said, the user manual goes through all of those um, in more detail so that you can choose the best um, construction quality that's appropriate for that structure. And then, yes, the cost adjustments here, um, you saw that underneath the uh, base cost area. So what to include, oops. Um, so again, the desk reference goes through all of this, but any materials that would be used at the fair market value for construction materials. We also have to cost uh, include the cost of any materials that were donated for whatever their fair cost is. And again, including repairs that people choose not to make um, to its pre-damaged condition. And then um, any labor. So even if people volunteer their labor, we have to cost it out as if it was you know, paid for at the regular value. Um, so again, there's cost estimating guides. Um, but what you can exclude is debris removal, cleanup, building plans, and any permitting fees. You can even waive the permitting fees to help people out if you choose to. Um, but yeah, again, the desk reference goes over all of this in detail. So I don't have to, um, you know, go ev go through every single one of these, but um, it should be pretty clear what types of costs are included, uh, the work, um, all of the materials, um, all of the finishing, uh, wall finishes, hardware, insulation, the utility services, any built-in appliances, so stuff that's actually part of the structure. Um, the costs excluded are, again, trash and cleanup, um, temporary stabilization for safety, um, any surveying, uh, permitting, planning, um, carpeting if it's over a finished floor. Um, anything outdoors is not going to be part of that. Um, the landscaping or outdoor lighting, that kind of stuff. That's not actually part of the structure, um, and plug-in appliances would not be part of that either. Um, so just an idea of this, uh, you know, if you're not sure, check the desk reference. Um, of course, your sources for uh, cost to repair could be an itemized cost of materials and labor. Um, building valuation tables and those cost estimating guides. If you have someone who's a local official that is a, a qualified um, estimator using their professional judgment or um, the least favorable would be building owner provided. Um, if they have supporting documentation, like the receipts for some of these materials, um, we just try to keep them out of the assessment altogether since they're not really objective. Um, just a, a couple of notes here. Uh, deferred maintenance wouldn't be part of this. So this is just um, maintenance that hasn't been done um, before the damage occurred, peeling paint, old shingles, uh, window caulking, that kind of stuff. Um, again, we're looking at the pre-disaster condition, so we're not looking at uh, this deferred maintenance stuff. So um, again, this is part of disaster recovery is a lot of um, emotional people. So, um, you know, you're going to be dealing with that. And again, this is difficult, especially if you tell them they have to elevate their structure, they're probably not going to be happy with it. Um, so we try not to have them involved at all in the assessment, as I mentioned. Um, 
they might not be objective. Even contractors might be trying to generate business. So um, that's not the same as a contractor giving an estimate, but inconsistencies like that would can delegitimize your assessments in that community. So um, you could institute a moratorium on issuing permits until the scope and location of the damage is evaluated, and you might uh, consider delaying um, until mitigation measures have been evaluated. So you can issue permits if the property owner can provide a contractor's estimate that's proving it's less than substantially damaged. Um, and of course, remember the cumulative substantial damage. Um, I was going to say something. Right. So when they're appealing your decision, um, they can either provide better information in the form of an appraisal for their market value or um, an itemized cost list from a licensed contractor. Um, so those would be considered um, you know, better information than the methods that we discussed previously with the tax data and um, that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> finally, we're getting through here. So you have uh, the element percentages tab. So this is where we're looking at what the percentage of those damaged features look like. And so again, there's guidance on what this uh, should look like, like what kind of uh, damage you should be looking out for um, to determine this number. And then of course, checking with at least one other person to make sure that they're in agreement of those things and definitely make sure that you're documenting this with photos so that you can um, better um, document and uh, defend your determination. So um, just having that as a bit of extra proof and just looking at um, these different elements. And again, it's different for um, non-residential versus residential structures. Um, there's just more of those uh, finishing elements to look at for a residential structure. But again, there's a lot of diversity in there. So this is for residential um, elements. So <clears throat> we're just looking at a few more things like appliances and finished floors and the cabinets and countertops and that kind of stuff. So. Um, you just have those other features in a residential structure that a non-residential structure might not have. So, and then yeah, there's <clears throat> this is just um, guidance on what to look for, and I think this is from the user manual, um, or it's the best practices. But either way, it's from one of those. Um, resources that we have so just looking at stuff like roof covering. Um, so we're looking for damage to roof, uh, sh roof sheathing, shingles, tiles, flashing, or other elements that are part of the roof covering. And things to look for are sagging, uh, watermarks, dripping water could indicate roof covering damage, um, daylight entering through holes, and that kind of stuff. So there's all this guidance on how to do the inspections and um, you know quantify that as a percentage. And then just a note here, <clears throat> just showing you what the software can and can't do, what the limitations are. Um, it's not going to provide exact values for the element uh, percent damaged. And because there's three options for determining the, the structure value and images, um, the determinations depend on your input as the um, you know SDE manager. So again, making sure you have a methodology um, established beforehand to make sure that you're making consistent and defensible assessments. Um, but there's a lot of benefits here that it's an organized, um, reasonable way to do damage estimates, um, demonstrate compliance with the NFIP. Uh, these are FEMA accepted methods for determining substantial damage or improvement. Um, and then you have those reports that are generated that can go with the letter that kind of shows them a little bit about how the assessment was created and it can support those ICC claims. So <clears throat> um, again, select server if you're in charge of assigning the assessments to other inspectors. 
clients, if you are to be an inspector receiving assignments or the standalone, if you're not a supervisor or a client, a, a client, sorry. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're hitting save every time you move between the tabs because otherwise you might um, lose some of that information. Um, there's also an installation guide um, to make sure that you're setting it up uh, correctly for the way that you want to use it. Um, so you might need to work with IT and there might be some things that you can't do until you get back in the office um, from the field. So just being aware of that, again, we don't wanna to spend too much recovery time dealing with these technical difficulties. So having this ready to go uh, beforehand is really worth the effort to, to get it set up. Um, again, the user manual is in the tool or you can find it online um, as well. <clears throat> There's some helpful features in here. Um, again, the default data. So that's the stuff that can be pre-populated for all of your property records. Um, it'll be useful in a disaster if you had just one map panel. Um, so you can pre-populate that and not have to type it in over and over. Uh, there's spell check, photo editing, and again, the enterprise import and export from other non-SDE sources. Um, <clears throat> so in the old one, there was no option for agricultural structures. And so I think it's there's 18 different types of non-residential uses listed in there. And so you just wanna make sure that you're using the best fit. Um, so there is guidance on how to decide what non-residential use should be used. Um, so of course they can't um, list every single type of non-residential structures that you would have in your community. But again, there's information on how to choose the best fit for that. Um, some other quick tips, um, brick veneer is not part of the superstructure. So this is just a type of siding that gets you know put on the outside and it's not actually made of brick. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. If it's marked as uninhabitable by you know, the emergency management or um, whoever, that doesn't necessarily mean it's substan it's not, or it is substantially damaged, sorry. Um, it could be a gas leak or something else that um, could be you know repaired simply that would make it habitable again. Um, and then apartment buildings are basically businesses, even though they're residential structures. So what you should use is the, the non-residential assessment for that. Again, we have to train the inspectors. Um, hopefully we have a team helping us out. So you can do some pilot inspections all together so that everyone's on the same page on taking data and making those um, estimates on the amount of damage. So again, there's difference between residential and non-residential assessments. You're looking at slightly different things. Um, and so the benefit of using the tool, there's reduced entry with the default data and that kind of thing, um, increased consistency and quality. Um, it has everything in there that you would need to do an assessment. Um, review using the GPS units. So it does ask for the latitude and longitude for property. Um, so you need that for the valid assessment. Um, there is resident and inspector interaction guidance. So that's definitely something to look at and make sure that your inspectors are familiar with before going out. Oh, and there's those numbers. So residential about 40 to 90 minutes, uh, non-residential 40 to 120. Um, so again, not all elements are equal and some of them are gonna contribute more to the market value than other elements. So, uh, this is what the main menu looks like. So you can see add property. Um, and then you once you have your whole database of properties in there, um, whichever structures need to be assessed, you can just start the assessment. So it's add new residential assessment or non-residential. And then you can see all the import export um, uh, tools in there. There's a user manual um, and you can view or search all records. There's a bulk editor available in there. Um, 
and then there's a, the tab for the um, default data. Um, so this is the property details. So it's just asking for that property information and then the map information um, and what caused the damage. Uh, so this is an older, just example of that type of property information from my previous supervisor, but basically just all of that um, basic information about the property and where it's located as far as, you know, the firm panel and what zone it's in. Um, so, there, again, there's a lot of guidance on how to determine depreciation. Um, the percent damaged of construction elements, um, and then the initial construction quality. So having some of this stuff uh, would be good ahead of time if you have that information available to you. Um, again, enter as much data as you can in the office before you're going to a property. So um, some potential information um, you can pull data from elevation certificates, permit files, your county appraiser, uh, those cost estimation guides to at least get your geographic um, adjustment, uh, the flood maps, of course, for your NFIP information, um, and field inspections. So again, take photos. Uh, you want to start with a little whiteboard with the address written on it um, and make sure Sure that you have at least one close up of that, um, and then maybe one farther out to make sure that you're identifying the correct property, and then taking photos of that damage. Um, right. So, and the the firm is you know another of those data sources. Um, your GIS department, if you have one, can help um, with some of that property information with all the parcels and that kind of stuff. Um, water lines can help you determine levels of damage. Uh, there's guidance on estimating that um, and definitely document any water lines that you come across. Um, the appraiser website often has a lot of this um, information that you'll need, um, and those are usually publicly available or available to you as a community official. Uh, the year built, the square footage, um, the grade factor, uh, building value, the owner's names, um, information that you would need for the assessment is, you know, available to you so you can start building this out. Again, something you'd probably want to do before there's a disaster, so, <clears throat> um, yep. So this is what it looks like. Uh, your list of properties will be there. So once you click start a new assessment, it'll pull up all your property files and then you can choose the correct property and then uh, start on that assessment. And then this is just the address tab. Uh, again, it, it just has um, that basic property information in here. Um, and then you can um, also, check if the structure address is the same for the property owner. So that might save you some entry when you're working on this. Again, hit save often. And when you hit save, it will um, show you some things that you might be missing uh, so that you don't leave anything out. So it just kind of gives you these little warning notes that, oh, you didn't um, enter anything for this particular uh, you know, field. So that's the, basically the address and structure damage information. Um, you have all the different street suffixes to choose from. Uh, and then this is the, um, the tab. Yep. So if you're getting errors, you might need to work with IT or um, check the installation guide. Um, but yeah, there's all these these different fields to um, identify what type of structure we're doing an assessment on, the foundation type, residence type, um, how it was built, all of that's included in there. Um, and then if you're uh, just calculating using the square footage and those other, um, uh, if you're using this method, It'll show you the different shapes that you can choose from and then um, help you to calculate the square footage. And again, that might be something that's available online as well. Um, but the, you do have this option <clears throat> for um, 
doing measurements. Um, So yeah, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and then of course hit save often. Um, and then you don't have to add in any cost adjustments or additional adjustments if there are not any of <clears throat> those unique features. Um, so this will calculate the replacement cost and the cost per square foot. Um, so this way you can calculate the market value. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, you're, we're also looking at depreciation. So um, there's of course more guidance on this, but basically you pick one through six and then it'll assign um, that percentage value to it, depending on how you, you rate the depreciation. Um, so this is one way to get a base cost. Um, in this case, they looked at sales and did the average for the base cost. Uh, that is an option. Um, again, there's cost estimation guides. They now have software for cost estimation guides, um, or th there's hard copies as well. And then, yeah, based on actual damages and those costs to bring it up to current, not including those costs to bring it up to current code, but um, on the element percentages, this is where you'll add in your uh, determination of how damaged that particular element was. Um, again, if it's clearly less than 50% or clearly more than 50%, um, those are not your highest priority, um, save those for last, because most appeals are between the 70 and 40% range. So you need to have greater precision and really take a good look at those. Um, and of course they have the, the option to appeal if they don't agree. Again, we have sample worksheets in our post-disaster manual. Um, this is what the uh, percent damage tab looks like. So you can see those three um, options. So you have the calculator that you computed the ACV. You have you can enter a professional market appraisal or again you the adjusted tax assessed value. So if you click on the different ones, it'll show you those different options. Again, pick one method that you're going to use and just stick with it. Again, there's a place for photos, um, and then again the output summary. And again, you want to have this whiteboard so that you can um, note the property address um, and set it up close. And then you should take a farther away picture and then keep those photos organized so that you can make sure that they're going into the correct assessment. Then you can print summary report once you've got this calculated and it'll show you um, the percent damage. Um, and then that's just saying, um, if you're doing cumulative improvements that you can um, include those previous improvements, um, you know, cumulative improvements, sorry. And then this is the summary report, which is a one page summary and it has a place that you can sign it and send this out with the letter to the property owner. And um, we have those template letters as well. Yeah, if you don't hit save, it could just give you a completely blank report. So again, hitting save every time you move through the tabs is important. Uh, code violations are not damaged, so those are excluded. Um, if there's um, special allowances explained in the desk reference, um, a finished basement would be part of the estimation for sure. So it's just uh, kind of going over that since we have quite a few basements in Kansas. Um, and again, if they want to dispute your determination, they can get a contractor estimate, a professional estimator, the insurance adjusted estimates, uh, disaster damage estimate groups can help or a licensed appraiser, and they can provide you with that information. You recalculate and then redetermine their level of damage. So again, written administrative procedures will help with this and make sure that you have a way to resolve any disputes. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, we have um, a minute or two for questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, so we have uh, 
a couple of comments and then one question. So the first comment is just about uh, letting us know that we had uh, people in the original Zoom link. Uh, we do apologize for that. We're going through some uh, internal changes. And so we had to update the Zoom link. But since this is recorded, we will be able to post this to our website and you can review it. And we do apologize to those who came in late. Um, the second one is from Darren Hobbs. He said he's worked with the appraiser's office and people would bring in insurance values. Um, and this sometimes would include different, would exclude different factors, like whether it's the land uh, or basement, uh, whether it had a basement or not. And so in his experience, the counter, uh, the county appraisal uh, value is usually a better indicator. And then finally, we have a um, question about the depreciation factors. Um is like the question is since uh, county appraisal values usually includes uh, depreciation of buildings, would that be would that uh, be called double dipping? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think you would just be able to include that information in the assessments and just use that for the determination on what level of depreciation you have. If that makes sense. Okay, so that's all the questions I see in the comments. Uh, do we play the polls now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yep, that would be good. And while Bill launches those, if anyone has any questions and would like to come off mute, feel free to do that as well. So yeah, on this one, we're just kind of gauging what your experience is with um, doing an estimate and um, you know, hopefully some of those other resources will help as well. Um, there's lots of other training out there, so um, definitely feel free to uh, take those as well. Um, the more you practice with it, probably the easier it'll be. Okay, it looks like everyone answered that question, so. Bill, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay, so uh, sorry about that. It looks like uh, we've got a couple who've, uh, who've uh, done this in the past and then some who are uh, new to it and have training and some who are not um uh, have done it and are just getting training so that's good that you're uh, taking this class just to get a little bit of uh um experience on it um so i'll roll launch the second one right and so this is asking if you're a cfm so i can send you a certificate for uh credit or if you just like a certificate anyways um i'm happy to do that so uh, I should be getting those out probably either today or tomorrow um, to you guys. So, yeah, it looks like everyone answered that as well. So, okay, um, that's it. Um, you know, feel free to reach out if you do think of any other questions, um, or if I can ever help at all. I'm happy to do that. But I appreciate you guys uh, joining us this morning. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks.